Well, and welcome everyone. Uh, we are delighted to have you with us this evening for another virtual event with Malaprop's Bookstore and Cafe. My name is Stephanie Jones Byrne, and I'm the director of author events at Malaprop's. And um, looking forward to a really wonderful conversation uh, with two of our favorite authors this evening. So, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to be with us. Uh, I'd like to start with a couple of sort of housekeeping announcements. Uh, first, we really would love for you to ask questions this evening, and you have two ways to do that. The first is to log into YouTube and type your question into the chat. You'll see some messages in the chat already. My colleague Patricia Furnish is behind the scenes posting links and other handy information, and you can join Patricia there to make comments and to ask questions. If you ask a question, we just ask that you start your question with a letter Q that just helps us separate the questions from any other comments. Your second option for asking questions is to send us an email. Uh, we have an email address just for that. You can send us an email at virtualqa at malaprops.com. That's virtualqa at malaprops.com and Patricia will post that email address for you in the chat as well. The other uh, sort of announcement or rather request is that we encourage you to support Malaprops with your purchases and we thank you and to also support local independent bookstores everywhere. We know that one of the nice things about virtual events is that you can join us from across the country or across the world. We may not be your local bookstore. We are still thrilled to have you with us. And we encourage you to support the authors that we're talking to by buying their books. Um, we just always ask that you shop Indies first. Independent bookstores are places of community and not just commerce. Um, and we appreciate you joining us in our community efforts. So thank you for shopping with Malaprops. Thank you for shopping with Indies. Specifically this evening, we're gonna be talking about the new book from Neil Thompson, The First Kennedys. And if you haven't picked up a copy yet, I know you're going to want to do that right away. And Neil was nice enough to stop by Malaprops earlier, earlier and sign copies. So if you do order a copy from Malaprops, you can get an autographed copy. And thank you, Neil, for doing that. So now it is my pleasure uh, to introduce um, the two authors that we'll be speaking with this evening. Uh, so first, Neil Thompson is a journalist and the author of five highly acclaimed books, including A Curious Man, Driving with the Devil, and the memoir, Kickflip Boys, a former newspaper reporter. He's written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, Esquire, and many more. Neil's appeared on NPR, PBS, The Daily Show, CNN, and many more. Um, he is now living out in Seattle, and we welcome him back this evening to our virtual event space to talk about the first Kennedys with our good friend, Denise Kiernan. Denise is an author and a journalist and producer and hosts Craft Authors in Conversation, um, a wonderful series of author conversations that you should check out whenever it's available as well. Her latest book is We Gather Together, which was published in 2020. Her last book, The Last Castle, about the Biltmore Estate here in Asheville, was an instant New York Times bestseller in both hardcover and paperback, and also a Wall Street Journal bestseller. She's also the author of The Girls of Atomic City, another New York Times bestseller, and has been published in multiple languages. And she lives right here in Western North Carolina. Uh, we are so pleased to have both of you with us this evening. Welcome, Neil and Denise. Hi. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. It's so great to be here. Wonderful intro. Um, I want to quickly say hi to uh, Malaprops folks and Asheville yeah. folks. This is my former hometown of Asheville, even though folks are hopefully joining us from elsewhere. Um, Malaprops remains one of my favorite bookstores uh, on the planet and one of the best bookstores in America. So it's a thrill to be back, even though virtually, but back with my good friend back. Denise here in Asheville to do this. So uh, thanks for joining us and thanks Malaprops for hosting. And thank you for chatting with me about it's this so new book. It's so good to have you 
back <laughs> in the Asheville world. Um, and it's, it's um, thank you to Malaprops and to all Indies. Uh, it, it's really hard to put into words how important indie bookstores are to authors, to readers, to people who just love this world. It, you know, it's, uh, I feel so, I feel so grateful to have malaprops in my world. I know you do too. Yeah. And it, it's just, it's just great to have you here. And I'm so excited about your new book. Thanks. The Thank first you. Kennedys. Um, and I'm excited to have you back in Asheville. Um, first time in the, in the, in the house. In the house. First time in the house. Yeah. Nice to have you here in the, in the zoom corner, in mm -hmm. the Kiernan zoom corner. I've seen it um, virtually many times. That's and right. Now I get to actually and now you're actually here. here. We're going to have cocktails delivered shortly. It'll happen. Of oh, Garcon, just, Garcon is, uh, he's, we're going to wave him on. He's going <laughs> to come on over. Um, and, you know, uh, this, this book, The First Kennedys, the title alone made me think to myself, you know, what is your first, what is your first memory of the Kennedys? Hmm. I grew up uh, similar to you, but maybe not 16 years of it. Uh, I grew up Catholic school raised, half Irish, surrounded by Quinns and Murphys and O'Gormans sure. and all these Irish Catholic kids. Um, full on 16 years of Catholic education. I was surrounded by families who probably had a bust of JFK on the, on the mantle like those families did. I, ours wasn't one of them. Uh, I, my dad leaned right for many years. Now he's thankfully, thanks to Rachel Maddow, swung left. I just saw him in Florida. But, uh, you know, we weren't a Kennedy household, is my point. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't raised on the Kennedys, wasn't raised on this homage to the dynasty and the royal family and all that. But I describe it in the, to your question, what's my earliest memory? It's, it's in the opening pages of the book. My first memory is working for the Baltimore Sun, going to Hyannisport, Massachusetts to cover the death of JFK Jr. And that was my like first sort of slap in the face realization of how important this family still is to many of us. Uh, you know, long after RFK and JFK have been killed, JFK Jr. dies and, and the nation weeps. Um, and I drove back from that assignment passed through New Jersey, where I was born and raised, and passed within a couple miles of the cemetery where my Irish immigrant grandparents are buried. And that confluence of covering JFK, going through my home state, thinking about my own past and my heritage, and being within a few miles of my dead grandparents, I thought, huh, what is this all about? The Kennedys, the Irish history, Irish immigrant history in America. What do I care about my own Irish heritage? So that was the beginning of it. 1999. It took me many years, many false starts to figure out what's, what is the story I want to tell here. Um, and, and along the way, I discovered what it was. And we can talk about that. But that early memory was JFK Jr. dead and, and, the, and the nation weeping. I described in the, again in the opening pages, being at a bar, sipping at Jameson's and the bartender, when we learned that they had just found the wreckage, starts crying and says, I feel like I just lost a family member. That was that was a realization to me. And that is, I mean, for me too, I remember exactly where I was where were you? when I was in a bar. <laughs> I was in a bar in Sunnyside, Queens. I was in a bar in Sunnyside, Queens. Um, I had just finished watching a soccer game with friends and was sitting in this bar um, in Sunnyside and the news came on and they talked about um, JFK Jr. whom I had talked to on the phone. Really? Yes, I don't know if I ever told you this story. I don't story. remember this. Yes, it, I actually- the George Magazine thing? No, it was the actually date? when I was a youngin. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> I, was a, I was a young, I was a young uh, worker and I was, uh, working at the New York Post at the time. And um, New York Post did the Golden Golden Globe, Golden Gloves. Uh -huh. uh, okay. So the, the boxing tournament and JFK Jr. had shown up to some of the uh, matches and my big boss, the big boss, the important guy, 
came out one day and said, you know, we want to make sure that JFK Jr. knows he has tickets to the final, the final bout, um, track him down, Denise, track him down and make sure he knows he has tickets. And I'm, I'm thinking, what? Is he the phone book? What? What? <laughs> what? It just rang and, up. and he, I think it was, I, I honestly don't remember. I think he was at the DA's office at the time. It was early in his career as a lawyer. And I finally arrive at his assistant and um, just tell her, I, I'm like, I'm not trying to just please, I'm going to get in trouble from my boss. Yeah. Just let him know. Just let him know he has tickets if he wants them. Just let him know. And our office um, at the newspaper was very busy and uh, there were a lot of people and it was phones, phones plugged into the wall, plugged into the wall, kids plugged into the wall phones, yeah. um, ringing off the hook constantly, newspaper office, blah, blah, blah. And <laughs> I, so I make this connection. And a couple of weeks later, all of a sudden, one of the guys who worked with us stands up and he goes, uh, Denise, John Fitzgerald Kennedy Jr. line one. <laughs> and I was like, and I just looked at him and he goes, mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, hi, this is Denise. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, whatever, he was lovely. And that, that was my little That's your little intro but, to the family. Um, uh, uh, but for me, I mean, I guess same with you. I'm, I'm a Kiernan, you know, I mean, it's, I didn't necessarily have this sort of, you know, Kennedy. Yeah. Yeah. Some, some families did and not so much for us, but. Yeah. Realizing uh, after that, how much they still meant to a lot of people. Totally. Yeah. But um, when that happened, when that happened, all of that came back to me and I thought, wow, this family meant, meant a lot to people. And so when you talk about a family like that, um, a dynasty, as it were, mm -hmm. what as a writer goes through your mind about, um, do I want to go in? Do I want to go here? Right. I mean, it's not, it's not as though no one has ever written books about the Kennedys. So that's the first thing that goes right. through my mind. Of is, course. Who needs right. another book about the Kennedys? Right. So <laughs> look, talk about, cause that's what fascinates me. Cause this is very unique and needed to be done. And this is fantastic, but we're seeing the final product here. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So we're seeing you going through that process. So let's take, take me back to the beginning of that when you're like, Oh my God, should I, should I be doing this? There were many moments like that. Yeah, no, it's, you're right. I mean, there have been millions and millions of words expended on the Kennedy family. And, and there were, there are many aspects of that family that I don't give a shit about. Like I, I don't, want to, I didn't, even though he's on the cover and we can talk about that. I didn't, I didn't want to write a story about Joe Kennedy. I didn't want to write a story about, you know, there's just been enough said. What, what interested me from the very beginning was this question of where did they really come from? Right. You know, I know they're Irish. I know they're, they're, that there are immigrants in the background. Um, and, you know, you can, well, we couldn't go to Wikipedia back then, but I could find out some little tidbits back in the day. And it interested me and intrigued me knowing that I came from Ireland, you know, two generations in. Um, so that was the the origins of this whole project. And so my first step in that direction was 2006, going to Ireland and going to the county Wexford where the Kennedys came from on the paternal side, JFK's paternal side, uh, both his great grandmother and great grandfather came from County Wexford. So I went to the town where the Kennedy side came from um, and, and that property is still in the family. It's still a farm with, you know, at least one of the old buildings that was uh, in existence in the 1840s when Patrick Kennedy left during the potato famine. So I got intrigued back then, but I still couldn't convince myself that anyone would care uh, about going back that far or that there was enough uh, of, a, of a compelling story to tell. So I kept putting it aside. Other books kept getting in the way. Moving to Asheville got in the way and, and spending years here working on uh, you know, a number of other books. 2016, um, we elected someone to the highest office of the land who succeeded by going after uh, immigrants, by 
um, aggressively claiming that we're not a nation of immigrants, or maybe maybe the good ones, maybe the white ones, maybe the you know the, the what, those from Norway. Um, and we had had all these like crazy to me. It sounded like at the time. Now we're inured to it, but at the time it felt bonkers that we're having these different conversations about immigration and the value of the immigrant um, and what they've contributed to this country. Something got triggered again then, where I felt like. Okay, the Kennedys are, are an immigrant immigrant family. I mean, any number of presidents, Trump himself, his family, his wife. You know, you know, it's just doesn't make any sense. But it reignited my interest in going back and finding out more about the early Kennedys, not just who they were and you know the escape from Ireland, but what was life like for them on the ground in America at a time when I knew in broad brush strokes, America didn't want them, just like America doesn't always want immigrants now. But back mm -hmm. in the day, back at that time, mid 1800s, the Kennedys were part of that first wave of Irish immigrants, many of them fleeing the potato famine and then just economic hardship after that. They were the, 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 the mass of refugees coming here, looking for a safe haven, looking for, for a new place to start a family and a, a new life. Um, and we didn't want them. We said at the time, word for word, send them back. That's right. Go back to where you came from. That's right. Keep them out. They're bringing their crime and their religion to this country. And that's when I realized there's, I want to go deep into that. I want to bring to life the early Kennedys and made my best effort at doing that. But I also want to explore what was happening around them at that time that made them the, the, uh, the, the enemy, the, the pariah that they were. And let's, I mean, let uh, potato blight in 10 seconds you know what i mean <laughs> yeah. I, it's let's talk about what the experience for an immigrant at that time was where they were living mm -hmm. what the experience was the journey coming here and what the experience was when they arrived here. Yeah. Those are three distinct stages, all difficult and horrific all in different ways. Yeah, yeah. 10 seconds each one. Yeah, go. No, so, well, no first, no, first potato blight. Okay, life in- Where's, where, Joe, <laughs> Garcon. Garcon, we love you. We're supposed to have cocktails now. And they're themed to the book. They're themed we'll, to the book. I mean, we'll these, we, have, like, we have cocktails themed to this book. So potato yeah. famine, Ireland was uh, owned by England, right? Like very few Irish people owned their own land. They were tenant farmers on their own land. It used to be theirs. England conquered Ireland, took over everything. And most people like Bridget Murphy Kennedy and Patrick Kennedy, who we'll talk about, grew up on farms that were leased from absentee English landlords. Yeah. So they were beholden to the English. Um, many Irish got their primary sustenance from the potato because it was cheap and easy to grow where they would sell their main crops to cover the rent. And, um, oh, look at here. Oh is. my God. Oh. Look, oh. a guest appearance by what Joe. A, Say hi, Joe. What a surprise. This is award-winning, uh, author Joseph Degnese saying hi. Okay, hi. All right. <laughs> and this is, what is the name of this drink? It's the Ward 8. You have the- The Ward 8. The Ward 8. Uh, right. okay, named have, after uh, the eighth ward in Boston. In Boston, which we'll we'll get to. We'll Cheers. get to. Thanks, Joey Cheers. D. Cheers. Thanks, Joe. Do you have the recipe? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yum. Oh. Way to go, Joe. Thank you, folks, for indulging our little yes. cocktail. So, potato famine hits. Uh, all the potato crops across the country are wiped out, um, and the Irish are mainly living off the potatoes. Um, so they either eat the crops that they're selling to keep their land to cover the rent, or they starve. A million people got sick, starved, died of disease. Two million people said, we got to go and fled. Mass uh, migration from Ireland, which lost like a third of its population within a few years. Bridget Murphy, uh, who um, was the first in her family to leave. Patrick Kennedy, first in his family to leave their respective farms. They first leave Ireland and go to Liverpool on a small, dangerous ship. Liverpool is just teeming with tens and tens of thousands of Irish refugees trying to get out and find a ship to take them somewhere, Canada, America, somewhere else. Uh, Bridget and Patrick, again, are a couple, the first of the first Kennedys, 
um, find a ship to take them to America and they both end up in Boston. That crossing was ridiculously dangerous. I mean, it just wasn't done. Uh, it wasn't a passenger yeah, talk crossing. Talk about that crossing, yeah. yeah. I mean, people weren't doing that uh, it, 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 as a means of transportation. It was only happening out of desperation. Right. It wasn't, it wasn't, oh, the, these ships are going anyway. I'm just going to get on board and, no, and it's not like, seek my fortune. Yeah. Not like I'm going to hop on the QE2 right. and, and cross over to America. There really wasn't transport to America. Many of these were converted slave ships or cargo ships. So they had their own terrible past already. Um, and they were just overstuffed you know, two, 3,000 people to a ship that was made for a few hundred. You know, they were they were sharing a bunk this wide and maybe five feet long, you know, two or three of them under, uh, you know, below deck. These ships burned, they hit, you know, icebergs and sank. Um, the, the, the passengers didn't get enough to eat or drink. Um, many of these were British ships and the British didn't give shit about the Irish. They were glad to see them escaping from sure. their land. It was just a terrible time. In fact, the English, you know, were many of the, the uh, not just the prime minister, but leaders in parliament and elsewhere were saying, well, they kind of asked for it. They got what they deserved. You know, this is God's way of telling me, showing the Irish, you know, um, that they're living an immoral and, and, and uh, bad life because they were all Catholics. So crossing was dangerous. I describe in the book, you know, these diaries of people describing plunk, 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 all the way across the Atlantic, bodies being wrapped in sailcloth mm -hmm. and thrown overboard. Kids being born at sea, they last a couple of days because there were no doctors on board, tossed overboard. So al already this crossing uh, into toward a hopeful new life is not very hopeful, it's terrifying. Then when Bridget and Patrick and these other waves of Irish immigrants make it to America, in their case, Boston, surrounded by tens of thousands of their countrymen, no place to live, no jobs. And then, you know, just beyond that melee is old school Boston saying, we don't really want you here. Go back where you came from. Right. You know, it was just, it's, it was terrible. Um, and, and it was the first time America had experienced that type of large scale refugee influx and America didn't want it. Um, and, and I try to explore in the book how that is reflective of our entire relationship with people from other places uh, since the beginning of the colonization of this country. Um, and so the, the, the discrimination and the hatred that uh, Bridget and Patrick and other Irish immigrants face was, I knew it existed, in general terms, but mm -hmm. uh, when I learned more, I was just shocked at how bad it was and how people just hated the Irish, hated Catholics, conspiracy theories, um, you know, secret clubs and secret mm -hmm. handshakes to try and, you know, conspire to, you know, keep them down or out or, you know, a political party, the Know Nothing Party mm -hmm. created just to, to, to uh, combat uh, Irish and Catholics, keep them out of elected office, prevent them from becoming citizens. So Bridget's life was pretty hard back in Ireland. Potato famine made it harder. She takes this big risk, crosses an ocean at a time when that wasn't common, and then comes to a, a city that in her mind was probably a hopeful place and was and really- they hated her. They hated her. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, what is, what's interesting what I think will be fascinating for people is that when you hear, when you think about the Kennedys, yeah. you think privilege and you think wealth and you think glamour <laughs> and you think all of these things. And what you learn in your book is no, this is all of those stories. You know, there is a very humble, painful, tragic, difficult beginning to all of this yeah and that there are so many surprise and it's you know it's hard because you know you sort of want to dance around the it's a surprising story in a way um and at the same time there are these families in the united states these names that conjure up images of of wealth and comfort and um, all of all of these uh, things that we want, you yeah, know, yeah. Um, and then you realize that when you go back far enough, 
these folks came from very, very, very difficult uh, beginnings. And that's, I mean, to me, that's the most wonderful part of this entire book. At the same time, as a writer, when you think about tackling a topic like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cheers. Yes. Okay. Thanks yeah, for joining us. When you think about a topic like the Kennedys, what as a writer do you ask yourself um, to decide whether or not this is a book you want to pursue, mm -hmm. right? Because this is a topic, right? This family has been written about. So as a writer, process-wise, um, all of those things, what are, what are the questions you ask yourself about is this how do I know I want to go here yeah because um interest alone sure but how do you how do you do that yeah and how do you make it relevant to a family that you you could argue isn't at this moment as relevant as they were when you had somebody in public office like there's nobody there's no there's not a Kennedy all in those Congress questions. right now all those so, questions so I wanted yeah. to I wanted to know and this goes back to you said 2006. I mean, you you you've been thinking about this for a long processing it's been it, in getting there. close and pulling back, getting close and pulling back. You know, we discussed the immigrant experience. That mm -hmm. was important to me to show what the immigrant experience was like for a family that we think of, as you put it, uh, as the epitome of style and wealth and power and mm -hmm. all these things. And I wanted to know, did they really come from nothing? And it turned as it turns out. They came from nothing. They mm -hmm. can't, that family could have, uh, you know, ended so many times during Bridget's first decades in America. Oh, um, and talk, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Talk about Bridget as a noun. Yeah. So, you know, please, because I mean, I, I, this is, there are so many amazing things that come out of this book. Little tidbits. For any of us who, my I'm half Irish, half Italian. So, I mean, I, like I'm an immigrant kid, you know, several generations ago, but 20th century. And there are so many amazing things that come out of this book. So talk about Bridget as a noun. Yeah, it was fun to discover this. So, you know, in Ireland at the time of my Bridget, our Bridget here, um, Bridget was the most common name in Ireland because of St. Bridget who is this patron saint of, you know, you name it, bartenders among others, but which I love, um, you know, the poor uh, uh, sailors, I think. And she's revered to this day in Ireland. There's St. Bridget's Day uh, celebrated uh, every spring. I think in early February it is. So super popular name in the Ireland and a name that represented a lot of things. She was, she was a, uh, there's a, some mythology around whether she was an actual saint or, but, um, but, she, but her, her, um, what she represents in Ireland is, is greatness um, and strength. And then when these Bridgets, like our Bridget gets to America, because there were so many of them, they're all named Bridget and they all end up working as maids, the name Bridget and maid became interchangeable as did the nickname or shortcut for Bridget, which was Biddy or Bridie, all those things became the synonyms for maid. Um, and I don't, I don't really fully explore this till the end of the book, but my grandmother, Irish immigrant grandmother, came here in the 1920s, Bridget, worked as a maid, but when she got to Ellis Island, she changed her name to Della because she didn't want to be known as a Bridget. A Bridget, yeah, a Bridget. Even though that's Bridget. what she did. Right. So, you know, that that's that's how our Bridget in this story started, you know, working at the lowest rung you could find pretty close. Um, and then her her ascent is is just remarkable to me. Loses her first son, John F. Kennedy, can't be buried in Boston because they won't allow Catholics to be buried in the city. She has to bury him in Cambridge to the West, loses her husband, uh, at, you know, 10 years after they land in America um, and is left with four kids, widowed and alone, working as a maid. That's that's a pretty low start for what we think of as the beginnings of the Kennedys. No, that's the whole I mean, that's what was amazing to me is we think about this family as wealth and privilege and uh, greatness. And this is someone who arrived in this country and was associated with the lowest, yeah. the lowest of the low. Yeah, they were the scum. lowest of the low. They were they were called scum and treated like scum. Yeah. Um, 
uh, you know, like other subsequent generations of immigrants were and continue to be. But you know, at that time, she was the scum du jour. But and there's a re- and there's a there's a modern day relevance to that. I mean, how we look at uh, there's a modern day relevance toward immigration that still is sadly pervasive. Yeah. Yeah. Today. And and, and you know what I realized. Um, my wife, Mary, who you know, she likens this uh, sort of nativist, anti-immigrant attitude to herpes. Mm-hmm. You know, it's always there. Sometimes it's in remission a little bit, but it's always just below the surface and then it pops out and, and it's really up. ugly again. Um, and you see that across time, going back to the beginning, way before the Kennedys. But to your question about, like, what about the Kennedys that I want to e- explore? Mm-hmm. It, it was this, the, the immigrant piece of, of the story, but I also wanted to get a sense of what was it about those early Kennedys and those early decades in America uh, as the, the despised uh, you know, outsider that shows up later in the Kennedys that most of us know and think of as the capital K Kennedys. You, you know, what, uh, for example, what characteristics in Bridget and her son PJ and PJ's siblings, his sisters, what trickled down to JFK and RFK and the Kennedys that we know. I wanted to get a sense of, you know, if you trace the the, the better known Kennedys backwards, did they did they get something DNA or characteristics or traits or qualities or sensibilities from these the, the 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 immigrant experience and you know the, that's that's a little bit speculative there's some sleuthing that i had to do to try and find those those uh those those lines that connect immigrant kennedys to 20th century Kennedys. i'm glad you mentioned the word sleuthing because one of the things i wanted to talk to you, to you about was the incredible amount of detective work you did <laughs> in this book um even just i mean you can't dissociate alcohol from this book uh, as yeah. you can't from this discussion, but that's, um, that's, why, it's that's why it's relevant. Yeah. Um, there was so much that you had to look into bars and places and locales and ships and all of that sort of stuff. You did an incredible, incredible amount of sleuthing yourself. Um, talk a little bit about that. Cause that was quite, I mean, that's one of the things that I found quite remarkable hmm. about this book. Thanks. I'm good. I'm glad a writer to writer. I'm glad yeah, that comes yeah. through. Because I mean, that... cause that's, you, you see that and you're like, hey. as a reader, as well as a writer, like going into that world from that perspective and like, what am I going to find? Where am I going to go? What yeah. can I figure out is, is very enticing. And I love that, you know, I could get, I could get lost in that stuff. Totally. You know, you have, uh, you have to find that discipline to stop. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. I learned enough about the Irish potato fan. Stop, write it, move on to, you know, the know nothing period of the 1850s. But you had stuff that was hard to find out like bars and locations and all that. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of on the ground research in Ireland, in Boston, um, and then I discovered, to my surprise, especially when COVID kicked in and we couldn't travel, mm-hmm. how much is online. I had no idea. We're both old school journalists, right? Yeah. Free internet journalists. Right. And I, I think I'm kind of tech savvy, but when I was forced to stop traveling to Boston and you know walk the streets of East Boston and go to courthouses and libraries and, and do some of that research from home, there's just a wealth of stuff, unbelievable stuff available online. Newspapers.com is one example that I, I was on probably every day for a year and a half. I visited newspapers.com and would do a little searching. You know, I found PJ Kennedy is the son of Bridget and Patrick Kennedy. I found the, the printed uh, public notice of his first um, yes. you know, application for a liquor yep. license for yep. his bar in South Boston. Yep. Um, I found every most public notices for any time he wanted to open a, a saloon. Um, any time he was involved, he became a politician. Any time he was involved in some legislative debate, I found those articles. Um, you know, 
found court records, found legislative documents, found genealogical records, passenger ship records, a lot of it online, which was kind of a thrill and a little bit overwhelming. But I, I felt like I just had to find the right little bits and pieces to bring this kind of world alive partly because Bridget didn't leave behind a diary. Right. That's and then and then you do all that work. And then as a writer, you have to call what you've found. Yeah. And when you've done the work to find it, it can be that much more difficult to say, God, I worked so hard to find that, but it probably shouldn't be in the book. Exactly. And so how do you, I mean, that's, uh, there was so much of that that went into this book, that sleuthing, that discovery. And was it, I mean, challenging to just sort of say, well, I found this thing, but I can't probably put it in. I know. There, I mean, I it's, mean, it's, it's the, you know, kill your darlings concept. And there were many darlings that I just, you know. Yeah. Um, shoot them in the head. Right in the All bottom, done. Right in the, Die. Right in the nugget. Gone. Um, but I wanted it to be a fast read. And so that right. helped me decide how and when some precious little item that I had gotten, sort of my hard work, hard earned little gem of historical, you know, information, if it really didn't help bring Bridget to life or move her story forward, um, then I got rid of it. I, you know, I probably w wrote twice as much as what ended up in the book, which is something you know very well. Yes. It's hard. It's very hard. And I think when you start to delve into, and this is, if I could say one thing about this book, I would say it's a surprising book hmm. because when you, when you think about the Kennedys, you have this particular idea of who they are. Um, and then you read this book and you realize, oh, but there's this whole other aspect to who they are. Um, so I don't want to talk too much about what you, I mean, it, it, it's so inspirational at the, at the, at the same time. I mean, did you, how did you know it was time to pull the trigger? Mm. I guess is my, so as a writer, I mean, we all, we all keep files and notes. This is a cool idea. Oh, that might be a good story. Oh, this, especially you and I both started out in journalism, yeah. right? So this might be a good story. This might be a good hook. This might be this blah, blah, blah. And then you look and you look and you look and you think, well, there's something here. There's mm -hmm. something more here I can dig into to, to decide there are challenges and benefits to tackling a topic that has been covered extensively. If you what find do it, you, you know, exactly? You know, take, yeah. So, how did you know there's a way in? How did you know there's a way in? What's your way in? Um, a few things. I mean, one was discovering Bridget's story, even though it hasn't been covered much. Doris Kearns Goodwin a little bit, um, another Kennedy biographer, Lawrence Lemer a little bit, but nobody went deep into Bridget's story, partly because they maybe knew they were going to run up against what I did, which is there's just not a lot known about her. She didn't leave behind letters and diaries. So it's it was that sleuthing thing that I was willing to commit myself to because that's where I wanted to start the and story. You, I mean, I wanted to bring her to life as best I could. Seriously, people like, <laughs> seriously. So I kind of knew what my starting point was, Bridget. Um, my end point, I kind of knew, I don't think I care about Joe Kennedy. I want to end this book somewhere before we get to know Joe Kennedy too right. much. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, I kind of go out of my way to debunk some of the mythology around Joe Kennedy by showing some of the things that he gets credited for or with are actually credited to his father, PJ. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one example among many is Joe Kennedy, the bootleg, the prohibition era bootlegger. Well, he wasn't. Um, he made a lot of money after prohibition from liquor imports because he had already been exposed to the liquor business through his father, who was a saloon keeper, liquor dealer, wholesaler, 
who after when, when prohibition hit briefly back to newspapers uh, his father applied for a liquor license like late 1919 just before prohibition went into effect so he was trying to work his businesses right up until they said no pj and joe his son took all the liquor from his businesses and put it in the basement of joe's house so anytime joe later had liquor to sell or barter or bribe people with it was his father's liquor Similarly, you know, a decade prior to that, 1914, Joe Kennedy in the, in the newspapers across America, youngest bank president in America, because he took over the Columbia Trust uh, uh, Bank in East Boston. It was daddy's bank. It was PJ's bank. It was started by his father uh, a decade before that. So all these little bits and pieces about the mythology of Joe Kennedy, the up from the bootstraps, poor East Boston kid were bullshit. You know, he was born to great privilege. His father had the means to send him to Boston Latin School and to Harvard. So he became Joe, the Brahmin that he always aspired to be, only because of the success of his first generation, you know, American born immigrant son, father, PJ. So I, that's where I knew I wanted to end the story just as Joe is taking over the family and he's going to take it wherever he takes it. We know the rest of the story as readers, but I wanted to end it there so that the book ends are. Bridget starting the Kennedys in America, and then PJ sort of bringing that family to great wealth and acclaim and success and power, um, and then Joe takes over. And that's I'm maybe giving too much away, but that's that's where I wanted to end my story. Yeah, and we don't want to give too much away, but it is an incredible origin story with an amazing woman. Yeah at the origin and we don't an think amazing, of the Kennedys as no we don't think of the Kennedys as starting with an amazing immigrant woman with absolutely nothing, nothing. yeah she's the matriarch she's and the overlooked she's hero it yep and that to me is what is so astounding and wonderful especially during women's history month right here's to Bridget to women, yeah to Bridget to Bridget and all the Bridgets there were so to many all the Bridgets yeah so the last thing I want to ask is, you know, as an Irish American, was there anything about researching this, looking into this that made you, I don't know, think differently about yourself as an Irish American? That's kind of question. a weird question. No, it's I don't a good know. one. I mean, you know, it's. I think, you know, because my Irish heritage drove that or inspired this in the first place, mm -hmm. Um, I felt like along the way I was learning about my own people in a sense. Sure. Um, um, and I learned on the one hand, you know, what they were up against, the crap that they were up against during the, the height of, you know, the anti Irish anti-Catholic decades of the 1800s, M my immigrant grandparents, Bridget and Patrick came in 1920. So, but it, it was still discrimination at that time. Um, so I felt like I got a sense of the, 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 the history of my Irish side, both in Ireland and in America. Um, and, and I also learned a lot about, and this was fun, the sort of the beginnings of Irish democratic politics in America, mm -hmm. which sort of started New York some, Boston some, but the Boston piece that I explore in the book was PJ Kennedy, Bridget's son, you know, uh, being part of that first wave with John F. Fitzgerald, Honey Fitz, the two parents, fathers of Joe and Rose, who became the parents of JFK and RFK. So that those early uh, uh, days of uh, first generation Irish kids running for political office in Boston was fascinating because it was a period where in Boston anyway, politics was dominated by the Republican Party, old school Brahmins, the Prohibition Party, and the Irish were just breaking in. And so Boston, we think of as an Irish democratic city, like the, the most Irish democratic city in America right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and But back in the day, it just wasn't. And so learning a little bit more about how that happened, how the Irish got into politics in the first place was revealing and just gave me a sense of, you know, where where my people came from, um, I, I think it was fascinating. There were just many little tidbits that I came across that were shocking um, for good and, and, for, and for ill. And, and hopefully the story makes sense to today's readers because I think to your point earlier, it does tell us a lot about who we are today as a 
nation of immigrants nation at, our, of immigrants. at our best, you know, That's John right. Kennedy's book, um, but a nation of immigrants, despite all the best efforts to prevent that from happening. Right. And that continues. No, I mean, it is what I find so compelling about this book is how relatable it is to the present moment and the present experience and mm -hmm. and and how much it has to say about what so many people are going through um, and continue to go through uh, today, coming to this country, going to other countries. One of the know? fun little tidbits, uh, I'll, I'll, we can maybe take questions after this, but um, I've traveled um, a few times in the beginning of this research for the book and then uh, twice more recently to, to Boston, but to East Boston, which is where the Kennedys, Bridget and Patrick and their son PJ lived and worked uh, latter half of the 1800s. Uh, PJ died in 19, 1929, but his whole life and career, political career and business career was in East Boston. So when you walk around East Boston now, back in the day, it was uh, Irish slums mm -hmm. for the most part. Other parts of the city, not so much, but where Bridget was uh, opened her own grocery store and uh, started her own small business and was this like striving, uh, impressive, rare female business owner um, in, in this uh, part of town. Now, um, instead of seeing grocery shops like hers or saloons like PJ's, because he ran a bunch of saloons, now you see little bodegas in East Boston and little Latin American markets mm -hmm. and Central American markets. And it's been an, uh, a, a, an evolving immigrant community since, since the beginning, especially since the Kennedy's day. And so it went from being Irish to Italian, some Jewish, um, some Eastern European, and now it's very much a Latino community. And you see these little businesses everywhere that are, to me, reminiscent of Bridget's small, ambitious. And that's America. And that's America. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, that's the thing about this. You, you think, again, you think about the Kennedys and you have this idea, but then you see this is actually just um, an encapsulation of the American experience, yeah. which makes it incredibly relevant to this moment today here. Um, and so, um, We'd love to hear some, to hear some, hi, Stephanie. Hi, We'd Stephanie. love to hear some questions. Uh, actually started talking before and muting there as if I haven't <laughs> done this a thousand times. Uh, <laughs> um, so we'd love to ask you some questions. First, thank you so much for the conversation. Um, it was wonderful Thanks, um, and I know has uh, gotten people excited about reading this book. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, thank you for that and love the, you know, the Women's History Month shout out. I, I consider, Denise knows this about me, I consider all the months, everybody's months. I just <laughs> want to put that out there <laughs> first and foremost. I think yes, all the months thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, but <laughs> as it happens to be Women's History Month on the calendar, absolutely. Um, a shout out to, you know, highlighting a, a female progenitor of, of a family that would become a household name, right? Exactly. Um, yeah, excellent. Um, I also want to give a shout out to your wife, Neil. Um, I can't let go uh, in my brain of likening anti-immigrant sentiment to herpes. Um, <laughs> Go Mary, go Mary, go Mary. There's a little. <laughs> I mean, and especially you know Mary, Mary. I mean, that's like knowing Mary is, yeah. <laughs> and especially, and that's and that's so particularly apt in light of of the, you know, one of the most glaring hypocrisies um, that we inhabit in, in terms of how we came to be in this country, how anybody came to be in this country, right? right. I mean, Buncombe County, you know, to its credit, recently acknowledged that this land is stolen. Yep. Uh, stolen from from the Cherokee. Um, so, and that's true of so much of our space. And then, so the fact that we do have these repeated infections, yeah, and mm -hmm. and this this constant sort of ongoing ongoing layer of 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 a uh, of uh, um, just yeah of of 
I don't even know what the best word is for that anti-immigrant sentiment sometimes because it can just be so virulent and so dark. So, um, and then it's, a, anyway. it's another way that this, this book is so incredibly relevant yeah. today. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's history and it's an old family or whatever, but it's just so today. It's so now. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, so I, I am, um, uh, Pardon me for talking so much, but thank you for in inspiring, <laughs> inspiring those thoughts. And I have a question from you from another dear writer friend of ours, Amy Cherix. Hi, Hi Amy. Um, Amy asks, Neil, did you encounter any barriers to your research because you were writing about this family in particular? Oh, that's mm. a good question. Excellent question. Thank you, Stephanie. Hi, Amy. Thanks for the question. Um, Amy. Nice to sort of connect. Um, virtually, um, barriers to writing this story. There, there were a few, um, I tried to reach out to the family, right? Like I tried to, I did my, made my, gave it my best shot. Wanted to let any family member who I could find a way to connect with know, I'm trying to go back and tell the origins of your family. If you have anything to contribute, any family lore, any history, any tidbits, any documentation, any letters, uh, you know, let's talk. I'd love to have it be part of this book. This is not, you know, uh, a, a slam on the Kennedys. It's not a dig. Um, this is really trying to understand where the family came from. Um, and a few family members were as cooperative as they could be, and they were gracious. And, and one family member after the other said, you know what? Sounds like a good story. Let me know when it comes out. I, I, I can't help you. I really don't, I don't know anything about that period of my family's life. Uh, I talked about this before. M Maria Shriver sent me a nice note after I sent her a galley of the book. And she said, because uh, I asked her if we could talk. And she said, um, I look forward to reading your book and learning more about my own family. Good luck. That, so that was the, not exactly a barrier. They weren't preventing me from telling this story, but they had nothing to contribute. But in a similar way, I, I work closely with the JFK Library, which is part of the National Archives system and uh, got to know the archivist there and the chief archivist and they were helpful and when I visited they would give me everything I asked for and when I wasn't able to visit and stayed in touch with them by remote uh, they were uh, cooperative as best they could be. They did crack open this uh, long closed bit of uh, a, a collection of papers called the PJ Kennedy papers. We talked about PJ earlier. These are letters and documents that he had left behind and to his kids and grandkids. And they, the JFK library finally digitized them and made them available to me halfway through COVID. So just in time for this book. Um, so not a blocker either, it was actually cooperation. But I, 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 I felt like the, the Kennedy family and I was told this by others who know the family, they don't feel like they need any more stories written about their family, even if it's this story that's a very different version of where they came from. I think they've been covered so much, hounded by the press, you can imagine, you know, hounded by, you know, tabloidy books and that kind of thing. And I think they were done with it. So uh, hopefully this uh, is kind of a testament to, to Bridget and the matriarchal origins of the store of the family and, and maybe gives them a, a reason to look back on their own history in a different way. And that's, I mean, this is also an interesting way to look at just the idea of telling stories about important families in American history, mm -hmm. whether, whether or not they want to participate, right? Yeah. I mean, because they're still important to our general history and you have to you have to look you have yeah. to go you have to do you have to investigate and participation or not i mean particip participation is great but sometimes not having particip you can't stop yeah. right yeah. i mean it's still important yeah i mean a story like this is still important you know I, I felt like bringing, bringing a new perspective to a, a family and its history, a family that we thought we knew and, and shining a totally different light yes. on a, right. a, a aspect of that history helps us understand that family more broadly and more fully. 
Yep. Um, and hopefully you understand our country's whether, history. Whether or not per, permission. Right, exactly. Right, yeah. is granted, yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm, I really appreciate the, the question again, Amy, thank you. And the answer, because that was actually something I was curious about. I was curious um, about how much the modern day Kennedys knew of this history that you're telling. And if, if they, um, because one of, one of the, I feel like part of the image we have of the, of the Kennedy family is as one that feels very far removed from anything humble. Right. Yeah, right. And, and so I'm, I was curious how much of this they actually knew. Um, and then completely speculatively, like what difference it might've made if, if, you know, if there were more of that sort of woven in at, as, as this, as the political and financial success came. Yeah. Um, but that's a different question entirely. Sure. No, but it's an interesting one because over yeah. time, I think if that family, uh, uh, again, I'll pick on Joe because he was, you know, an unfaithful husband and uh, not generally known as not a nice guy, sort of aggressive with his kids, pushed everyone to just be the best and succeed and, you know, win at all costs. You know, there's nothing second is losing, coming in second is losing, those kind of things. He was not a great role model, an important figure, sure, uh, historically, but I feel like um, because his story dominates the mythology of the Kennedys and the mythology of Camelot, we lose the female stories and we lose this origin story of Bridget's. Um, and I describe in the very end of the book, JFK going to County Wexford, where his great great grand great grandparents came from, Bridget and Patrick, and going to New Ross, the town where his great grandfather Patrick made barrels, and giving a speech there and talking about Patrick, but not saying a word about Bridget, who was the one who actually kept that family going and deserves credit for giving us the Kennedy family that we know of today. Patrick died of tuberculosis ten years after making it to America. I mean, bummer, but. Bridget's the one who, who kept it going. And instead, when JFK gets to, the, to, to Ireland, he gives a shout out to Patrick, not Bridget. So, you know, just an example of the sort of male dominated, uh, you know, male, male centric uh, aspect of the story throughout time, uh, overlooking the females. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, now I can't help but maybe that's maybe that's an alternate history novel, um, like, who the Kennedy family might have been had, had they right. had yeah. they embraced oh that? Oh my God! Yeah, know, the, the matriarchy a little bit. Um, how we how we might have been as a country? You know, that's that's one of this one of a nice speculative fic fiction trope. I, I know that it's been done, but um, so I have um, one more question before we're actually almost out of time. It's it's been such a lovely hour. Um, another Patricia. Um, is asking where did PJ's drive come from to achieve a life so different from that of his parents? Um, you alluded to, to Joe being like instilling that drive in a terrible way, but um, hopefully that's, that wasn't the case for PJ. It, it wasn't. And um, I appreciate the question because I think we, we talked a lot about Bridget and she deserves it. PJ who comprises kind of the second half of the book we didn't talk about as much and his story is just remarkable to me. I think his drive came from Bridget, right? Like he was, he, he lost his father when he was 10 months old. So he was raised by his mother, his uh, three sisters, his aunts who came to America first, a quick aside, more Irish immigrant women than Irish immigrant men came to America during the 1800s, the only ethnic group where that was the case. So Bridget and PJ's aunts and, and the, the women he was surrounded by were a huge influence on him. They came here, took those risks. They were a spunky bunch, uh, started their own businesses like Bridget did. So I think he was deeply influenced by the women in his life, became a su successful saloon owner, as we talked about, and ran many businesses over time, became an influential politician. But he was also someone who is known as a uh, for caring for and helping his his constituents and his neighbors. Like I have a quote from Joe late in the book complaining about his father loaning too much money to people who were in need, right? Like Joe would have kept the money. PJ gave it away. 
gave away a fortune is how it, he's been described. So he was um, someone, again, I think because of Pat uh, Bridget's influence, who did everything he could as a politician, as a bartender, as a businessman, as a real estate guy to give back and help other people, especially his people, Irish immigrants. Um, so I think that uh, sort of humble, you know, to use that word in the title, the humility comes from him and you see some of it in his grandkids, none of it in Joe. Interesting. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, that was also another great question and a, a lot of insight um, just in this hour. Um, but we'll, we'll, we will encourage folks to read the book for a lot more. Um, so uh, as, we, as we wrap up, um, thank you, Denise. Um, the First Kennedys, The Humble Roots of an American Dynasty by Neil Thompson. Uh, it's the book we've been talking about this evening with Neil Thompson and Denise Kiernan. Um, and uh, Denise's most recent book is We Gather Together. Um, so thank you to everyone again who's been with us. And thank you so much to Neil and Denise. I wanna give you the opportunity for any last words before we say good night. Uh, just thank yous all around. Thank you for doing this. It's great. It's great to see you again. It's been a while. Joe, thanks Hell for yeah. the cocktails. Thank you, Joe. But real quick, we didn't mention the cocktail. It's called the Ward 8. Yes. Named for the 8th Ward of Boston, which was one of the wards that these Irish politicians uh, took control of in the late 1800s. PJ was the boss of Ward 2, but this cocktail is Ward 8. But I wanted to say uh, thank you to you, Stephanie, yeah. and to Patricia. Um, and to Mala perhaps for hosting this and for being just such a great supporter of writers and thank good you, stories. Thank you, Andes. And I hope folks who are interested in the book will will pick up a copy if you're local from Mala perhaps or order it uh, for delivery from Mala perhaps because I signed a, a few today and I know a lot of Denise's books are there too. So I hope you guys will support Mala perhaps and other indie bookstores. And thanks for tuning in. Thank you for that. Thank you both so much. And um, everyone, please stay safe and well. And and we'll. Look forward to seeing you again in whatever fashion we can. So <laughs> good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Okay.